and that's all right and we're back and we're we're not live but we're back on another exciting episode of starfleet boy where we have a casual and informal conversation about star trek and where the phone rings sorry you're good. I just hung up on him, whoever they were. <laughs> Welcome back, uh, Doctor. How are you today? Good, good. Glad to be back. And welcome back, Braxton. Nice to see you again. How are you today? Oh, thank you, sir. I'm having a great day. Excellent. We're here today to talk about the episode, season six, episode nine. <laughs> I forgot. <laughs> uh ship in a bottle the or otherwise known as the wrath of moriarty oh mm. <laughs> come on that was like it totally wow. was. <laughs> it, it was actually like space seed is what it was like because picard basically strands uh khan and the love of his life on it i mean sorry moriarty and the love of his life uh, and maroons them in wow. a holodeck for eternity, where buried alive. Buried alive. Is this where this <laughs> show is going? Wow. I mean, you didn't see that. You didn't. That didn't occur to you that like it could have. If like Next Generation still had successful movies, like after Nemesis, they could have done the Wrath of Moriarty. Like that could have been the next, the next movie. from the little thing, right? Uh -huh. He could have figured out a way to to really break out of. Uh, <laughs> right. <it>. Okay. <laughs> I mean, and not to mention the parallels to the Matrix and Inception. There's also that uh, going on. Oh, this is going to be very interesting. I can see. Mm, mm, mm. <laughs> uh, do either of you gentlemen want to do the episode summary? I mean, you should do it. Uh, hmm? Okay, I should. You should. Do I think it. the. All right, I'll do it if the doctor says no. Also. I mean, I'll do it, but it'll be very short. I like short summaries, so I'm going to acquiesce and <laughs> say, go for it, Doctor. <laughs> All right. The Enterprise is on its way to uh, investigate uh, two... The, the uh, coalescing. The coalescing of two gaseous giants <laughs> into a star, and uh, uh, Data and Jordy are playing Sherlock Holmes again, and Everybody's left-handed, so they call Barkley. Hey, Barkley, fix uh, the freaking holodeck. And the holodeck uh, burps out Moriarty. And <laughs> he uh, he tricks Picard, Data, and Barkley into thinking that, uh, they're, that Moriarty can walk out of the holodeck, but it turns out they're really in, a, in, in the holodeck the whole time. And uh, as you alluded to earlier, uh, Picard pulls a, a Kirk and, and maroons Moriarty <laughs> in a ship in a bottle forever. Very End nice. Summary. That was okay. That was a very, very short summary. I have to say it got every, just about everything in there. You forgot to mention the woman, <laughs> the love of Moriarty's life, uh, who's also a character. There'll There's be more of that later. <laughs> There's lots of twists and turns in this episode. Yes, there uh, is. A lot of twists and turns. So I think your uh, summary was fair, except you forgot the biggest twist was that Picard tricked Moriarty into thinking he actually left the holodeck at the end because they were, to, they were able to program the holodeck within the holodeck with Barclays, who's like a holiday genius. So uh, no, the biggest, <laughs> the biggest trick for the audience uh, in the show was that Moriarty, that everybody was on the holiday. You know, I feel like we got halfway through and then we figured out, oh, everyone's on the holiday. Um, so before, Captain Picard, um, you know, tricks Moriarty. We have the big reveal that everyone is on the holodeck. It's only what um, Captain Picard, uh, Data, Party and Data, and yeah. Data. Yep. Right. Right. Well, actually, so <laughs> wait. Now I'm confused because I didn't think everyone was on the holodeck. I no, only I thought. What's that? Go ahead. I only thought that it was Barkley. Data and uh and sorry, Barkley Data and Jordy. No, no, Picard. That's okay. See, we're all confused. I'm totally confused. Yeah, no, no, Jordy's <laughs> not real. 
<laughs> what, Jordy's not real? Mm -hmm. Yes, no, I remember that now. You're right. Jordy's not real. But he there's a real version of Jordy that's outside the holodeck. Yes. I guess what I was trying to say. Yes. Riker uh, is dealing in other words, Riker and Picard are both dealing with, with Moriarty at the same. I mean, Moriarty is pretty awesome. I have to say, like, as a character, I jokingly said the wrath of Moriarty, but you have to admit, like, the character was designed, like the character is just pretty amazing. And yeah, yeah. uh do you guys know the actor who plays uh, Moriarty, uh, who he is? No. No. He, he <laughs> I know him from another show called The Nanny. <laughs> oh. I, I don't know. If, did you know? <laughs> and he was a snarky butler. Uh, his, his name is Daniel Davis, and he was a snarky butler. And uh, Braxton, I don't know how big a Sherlock Holmes fan you are. Um, but we're going to find out today. <laughs> we're going to find out today because the doctor and I are huge Sherlock Holmes fans. And in particular of the Jeremy Brett Granada 19, it was a, a version of Sherlock Holmes that was in the 1980s. <laughs> and I think I can say this for the doctor as well, but I and the doctor consider Jeremy Brett to be the definitive portrayal of Sherlock Holmes ever. Oh, wow. Like oh, he's wow. the, Jeremy Brett is the uh, epoch. Cuisard's Cataract. Uh, yeah, he's like the Cuisard's Cataract, whatever, you know, the guru of Sherlock. And yeah. and Benedict Cumberbatch is okay. Like, mm -hmm. he's amusing to watch. But if you watch Jeremy Brett, you're just like, there's no competition. None at all. I think, I think, Be I think Benedict Cumberbatch would also admit to that. Uh, Probably. <laughs> if I had to guess. But Daniel Davis... I think is a better Moriarty than the Moriarty that they had on those Granada TV series. I think that he, the actor who plays Moriarty here, and especially in this episode, I just really liked how he like uh, was so deep and like there was so much to him. And like, even you know, the, the scene that I really liked the most is when he's, you know, Picard the whole time is suspicious uh, that he's, uh, you know, he's like, you're, there's no way you can escape your programming as a uh, criminal mastermind. And, and he's always like, uh, professor, I must remind you that, that, uh, cr doing these criminal things will, will land you in jail. And he's like, I'm not those things. He's like, I'm beyond, I've, I've grown beyond what was written by 400 years ago by mm. some Englishman, the way he puts it, you know, right. uh, and he, and he's this new thing, but yet the whole time, Though he is, he still resorts to uh, criminal-like activities in order to get his way, mm -hmm. uh, such as threatening the Enterprise's thousand crew to death. So yeah. he hasn't really changed. He's not really different. So I just loved it. I like I like the tragedy of it, and I think he mm -hmm. would have been a great Moriarty in one of those. I think he would have been great in like one of those classic <laughs> series. Uh, honorable mention to the Moriarty in the Robert Downey movies. I think he's pretty fab too. Yep. I totally agree. He, <laughs> he, he was a man of his programming. So yes, he was devious and he held everyone uh, hostage to get what he wanted, but he was also like, Oh, I think therefore I am, you know? So he was like a man of his programming, but then he kind of wasn't at the same time. And I really enjoyed what, that. Which I think all humans, to some degree, I think there is, uh, you know, another series I love is Battlestar Galactica. I think that we grapple with this idea of destiny versus, uh, you know, choice, right? Mm -hmm. Like, uh, nature versus own... nurture. Uh huh. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. <laughs> or more like make your own destiny versus your destiny is written in stone. You know, like uh, many people, you know, believe that like we are programmed to exist and we have programmed with a purpose and then others are like, no, we can defy this purpose or we can do whatever we want. And so I think that is also a theme that's inherent in Moriarty's struggle and the way that it's portrayed. And again, beautifully acted by Daniel Davis. <laughs> so tell me, so what did you guys think of the, uh, of the opening scene? You know, we open... Uh, Jordy, Data, uh, some holograph character, they're like solving a mystery and they're like, oh, okay, so I've deduced this thing and you killed your brother and I'm going to throw this thing to you and right hand, left hand. What'd you guys think of that scene? Oh, uh, how, so uh, I think that it was like classic Sherlock Holmes type tropes, but I, I don't remember 
any of the i don't remember a character like you know i think they they only uh they make up new i new things for the hol holodeck so it's like data's doing these adventures but they're kind of like invented by the computer to try and fool him and that's kind of what i got but he's he's never really fooled because he's like you know like sure data is like you know sherlock holmes in the sense that he has a great capacity to reason deductively like he actually sees details that the normal you know person would not see you know and so like data is like uh data and sherlock holmes being compared i think has always been like a a thing that made sense to me i will say that i've never really enjoyed brent spiner's <laughs> <laughs> portrayal of Sherlock Holmes. I love Brent Spiner to death and uh, I would tell him this uh, in person because I think he does it a little too much like Basil Rathbone and I think he needs to do well, it. <laughs> he looks like Basil Rathbone. He does. He is a he's dead the, ringer. He's got the profile which which is which is you know the who's it's it? True. He is, Sydney he is a dead ringer. <laughs> yeah he's a, he's a dead ringer for the Sydney Pageant uh, uh, Holmes. Yeah, I'll get, yeah for sure uh, that's true. <laughs> but I, 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 I will, I will say that his, his. Uh, I mean, obviously, it's Data playing Sherlock Holmes. It's not Brent Spiner, right? Which is why it's it's Brent it's Spiner genius. playing Data playing Sherlock Holmes. So there's a there's a there's a tad bit of uh, of maybe layering the top, um, uh, you know, in 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 his performance. But it's worth noting that, um, you know, the Sherlock Holmes bit. Uh, with with uh, with Watts with uh, Jordy and Data was you know they, they they first did it in the second season and it was meant to be an ongoing thing uh, a yearly thing that they would do every season. However, when they first did it in the second season, uh, the uh, the producers uh, seem to have well the, they they seem to have gotten in trouble with the Arthur Conan Doyle estate. Uh, and uh, for years, I thought it was because they didn't ask permission. Because tr uh, truth be told, they they didn't really uh, ask permission from the estate. But I was just reading up on this episode, and I read that in fact it was a misunderstanding between the producers and uh, and their Arthur Conan Doyle estate over over young. Sherlock Holmes, which was oh, the Paramount. movie that came out. Oh, the yeah. movie apparently the uh, the Arthur Arthur Conan Doyle estate did not like or approve of of that movie, and they were very annoyed with Paramount, and and that's why they didn't really uh, they they were they they were angry at Paramount when they used Sherlock Holmes again in Star Trek, but uh, but eventually you know things come down and. And they were finally able to to do to to do this episode, which uh, was intended to be done much sooner than the sixth season. Hmm. Very interesting. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Starfleet boy, my interpretation of the opening scene is a little different than uh, than yours. So, <clears throat> my interpretation of that scene was that uh, Data and uh, and Jordy were doing Star Trek, or doing Star Trek. Doing Star Trek. <laughs> they were doing Star Trek. <laughs> they were doing Star Trek. <laughs> Sherlock. And, so, uh, and Sherlock and Holmes. And so it was supposed to go a certain way. Uh -huh. And then the dude who... Oh, he was the, being left-handed. Yeah. Well, the secondary character was using a different hand. It was like, oh, okay. This is different. Why is it different? And then the next scene, Barkley goes and he's like, oh, okay. Well, like, I'm discovering that it's different because of this isolated program in the holodeck file. And then we start seeing Moriarty. So I feel like it's different because Moriarty is in there messing with things. Oh, um, exactly. Yeah. No, I agree with that a hundred percent. I think Moriarty, the, the tell is that everyone seems to be left-handed by default and Moriarty's left-handed, you know, so he kind of, when he programmed like these oh. characters, he and, okay. Now I understand what you meant by everybody is in the holodeck. It's true from that perspective that he created like everyone <laughs> on the enterprise <laughs> so that Picard, Barkley and data would not notice but also we were tr we were tricked twice which is great i you know like when an episode this is mm. i think this is a good episode from like a structural standpoint because like as an audience 
member, you really are uh, fooled the first time. And even actually, you know, I think I, I guess maybe my brain works in such a way where I erase the the surprise because I seem to get surprised every every single time by it. <laughs> like so kudos. But I would say that, yeah, there's that. And also, I think in one scene, Counselor Troy is wearing a different uniform or something like that. Yeah. Um, I I wrote I wrote some notes about those little you know discrepancies where where you start to see it uh, come to light. Um, I've got a lot of notes. Uh, so Moriarty says he was in the in the holodeck when he finally meets Picard. He well he tells Barkley this, but but then Picard apologizes for it. But like that he was in the holodeck conscious throughout the four years, like meaning he had like moment he could detect the passage of time. So that was one of the reasons why I think he was so upset and angry is that like, it wasn't just like quiet sleep for him. Like he was actually like conscious the whole time. And he's like, why isn't Picard doing anything to fix this? And I actually got the impression, I don't know how you guys felt about this, but I thought that like Picard's like reasoning was kind of half-assed. Like, I think he really, they really didn't do anything in the last <laughs> <laughs> well, I didn't kind of like. I didn't believe they kind of like, at all. We we uh, <laughs> we handed it off to the science team on uh, regular seven. Uh, <laughs> they, uh, they've been working on it this whole time, uh, you know. <laughs> and Moriarty's like, I love that scene actually because Moriarty's like, I just don't believe a thing you're saying. <laughs> and I was like, like it for once. I was like, wow, Picard's like a total. Uh, He's really uh, stretching yeah. the truth here. <laughs> I mean, he was right. Uh, you know, that, that that actually brings up a good point, which is, um, and I, I actually, for, for this, I went back and I rewatched our discussion of Elementary Dear Dave. Oh, how exciting. <laughs> and, um, and and if you want, I, 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 can, I can, well, I don't know if I can share the screen, but uh, definitely one of the concerns I brought up is you would have thought that after elementary dear data where all Jordy does is say computer create a foe capable of defeating data and automatically sentient life is created at the snap of a finger it's you true it's thought, instantaneous you would have thought that they would have put all the holodecks like on like they're just okay let, let's take them all offline let's figure <laughs> out what's going on this is some crazy shit going on and 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 that hasn't happened in four years and, and the crazy shit continues because vic fontaine continues. yeah vic, vic fontaine. fontaine in ds9 is a character who's much very much like moriarty and then of course dr zimmerman on voyager yeah. is is like you know very much like this too and they they all have personalities and like appear to have but sentience. here's my question the computer creates them so is it really the computer we need to be afraid of or <laughs> is it the holograms <laughs> we need to be afraid of it's i'd the like computer. to know what you it's guys the, think i think the computer i think the computer is is uh well it's okay so this goes to the argument this kind of parallels the argument is a gun a tool or is it <laughs> or is it something that does the killing right like is the computer yeah. just a tool or is it the actual like villain in the in the story and it's hard to say <laughs> it so, depends, you know, so it depends think, on how the computer what, what do you think <laughs> braxton are um, we more, afraid of should we be afraid of the computer or the hologram <laughs> uh the computer uh moriarty said it uh i think therefore i am you know i uh, i i i love that scene i think therefore i am you know he well no it wasn't he it was uh it was the was it him in the <laughs> in the computer that was it was him in his own hologram in his own holodeck yes so therefore he, it's the computer it's the yeah. computer we should be scared of yeah. the computer yeah. but see he, here's my question okay so, but the computer see i i think with this episode and I don't think it was so much in the first one. I think it's especially with this one. We're starting to sort of move into into Tron territory. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, we've all seen Tron, right? Yes. Where the programs have their own personalities, mm -hmm. you know, which really doesn't make any sense. It's the computer. 
Nice, you know, uh, nice the, the program that up. Should, is should running. Totally thought about that. It's true. Right. The program is running on the computer. So really, if there's any sentience, it's coming from the computer, not from the program. But now here we seem to be getting it the Tron way, which maybe the, the computer is not sentient, but it is creating something sentient, which I think is, mm. is interesting. Mm. What do we think about that? Mm. The computer on the Enterprise is like, uh, when I was young, it seemed like a dream machine. Like, like this is now this is a far this is far away from reality, and this is like you know whatever 1992, right? This episode, 93? more or less, yeah, yeah. So in 1992, and Braxton, I think, was in elementary school, if I'm not mistaken. Oh my god, I was a I was a freshman in high school in 1992. Oh, you're like our age. Oh wow, you, you okay. look so young. Yeah, I'm, I'm 41. <laughs> Oh my god, you're exactly our age. Well, no, wow. my age. Wow, Braxton, you're doing life better than I am. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> like, What's the secret, I, man? <laughs> very nice. All right, so, okay. Then you know the computers were like, you know, we had dial-up modems at the time. Like, uh, the, the maximum capacity on a hard drive was in megabytes. Like, you know, you were, like, impressed if you had a 500 megabyte hard drive was like ridiculous mm -hmm. what you know like um for real just just yeah it was it was a different time and we're getting into uh you know the territory where like in a hundred years like it won't be anything to have a phone with like an exobyte of memory on it you know i, I just yeah. have a feeling which you know the enterprise computer is insane so one of the ways i imagined I, from this episode i i actually thought a lot also about the technology behind everything. Um, but one of the things I imagined is like, you know, just to support the navigation functions on the enterprise alone, the computer has to have an extremely detailed model of the galaxy within its data banks, just like the most like, you know, like, so, so what it can create, like all these things that it needs to just do basic functions mm -hmm. are like the feeding ground for all these miraculous things it can do or when it's honed through someone like Moriarty, like a character or a program like Moriarty. So the computer itself is not capable of the level of like sophistication or personality that Moriarty is, even though it's the source of Moriarty, but a, a, a task was requested of it. And it said, oh, I need to do my best job. Like the computer itself just said, a, a, a crew member requested this thing let me try the best I can. And it ended up, I remember in the previous episode, it ended up like draining a bunch of research. Like it was a huge chunk of mm -hmm. like resources or whatever. I don't know. Maybe I'm making that up, but, <laughs> but regardless, I imagine that that's the case. And so it creates this like sentient program, mm -hmm. but I don't think the computer intended to create the sentience. I think that's also a mistake. I think it just happened that when you put all these like different things together that are required to create an adversary for data you end up getting something that borders on or appears to have sentience just like data does but i think Mori moriarty shows what's interesting about moriarty uh is and then later dr zimmer and 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 vic fontaine is that it shows that the computer can develop and maintain a genuine persona or personality mm -hmm. is that the is the computer that persona no it's the battery that's powering that persona but you know what is that persona and that's the truly like un that's in the unknown territory and that's where like i think this episode and episodes like it are pretty awesome but does it make sense well two things does it make sense that the computer can power a personality and the computer itself not have a personality I think it makes sense in the because in the Moriarty that, like, does take over <laughs> the, the ship. So the thing I think the way right? to, I think the way in to the look at one, it. At least, well, yeah, in the first one. I not think in the, the way second to look one because it, it's it's a it's a hologram. But in the first Moriarty episode, he does take over the ship, the actual physical ship. So the thing right? is, you feed the computer data. You tell the computer what you want, what you right. want, the parameters, and then the computer goes about creating it so mm -hmm. with moriarty in the first episode uh gosh i forget who it was but it was like oh like yeah like give me a uh, a nemesis that's 
like data or this or like is superior to, to right. data. And so it Capable created more yeah. mm -hmm. Right. Um, so I think that you give that you upload all this information into the computer and then it does something. And it's totally out of hand. I think that Moriarty and the computer are indistinguishable from one another in the same sense that you are you are indistinguishable from your body and your brain, right? Like, mm. where where do you exist? Do you exist in your mind? Do you exist in your heart? You know, like where where but, where? But, does, okay, let's follow that. Know, let's follow that. So, My wait, brain so I think that like can create wait, a character, so, right? But I our write a character. Capable, yeah, and our brains are also capable we're able to act i mean actors do this every day they're able to create a persona right that is, that is not, not them. Them, them right and so it in much the same way the computer is the brain if you will that's powering that gives that feeds this persona where does the persona exist on the computer we know that where we have no idea that's the mystery no one knows it's not even the, that, the crew of the enterprise they've been able to they've been able to isolate it to a sub a program but even Moriarty claims like he was not isolated, like he was still conscious throughout mm -hmm. those four years, mm -hmm. meaning he was integrated into the other functions of the computer. Like he mm -hmm. had these moments of awareness that proved to me that he wasn't, they weren't able to just take that persona out, if you will, and isolate it for four years. Mm -hmm. And even now, uh, riding well, around in that right. little mini holodeck mm. who knows moriarty could have infected the whole you know there's there's a you know there's a awesome way to tie in the whole control thing with this since control supposedly is from the future mm. how interesting would it be to have moriarty be the villain behind the you know things like control or whatever I don't know. oh wow <laughs> wow with that wow. Is, control is a fan fiction <laughs> thing you're talking about? Oh, yeah. So the doctor doesn't acknowledge Star Trek Discovery. So, yes, I am talking about fan oh, fiction. No, but ironically, no, but ironically, Dr. Control comes from Deep Space Nine, Section 31. There's books. Bashir is in charge of Section 31 in the future. In the it was I know, but I'm just saying it's not, it's, called control. <laughs> it's not called Control, but it's still similar. But how interesting. I, I looked it up. I didn't see any mm -hmm. like follow up novels about Moriarty. I think he's a dead character after this, unfortunately. No, he, actually, oh, really? The Star Trek website, mm -hmm. um, I guess, leading up to one of the uh, one of their uh, online games. Uh, they did something. They, they did some pages <laughs> that said the lead up to the path to 2409. And in it, the Star Trek.com stated that the Sung Foundation learned of Moriarty's existence and sued to take custody of the holographic program, while Starfleet attorneys argued the security issues of doing so. Wow. So, oh, wow. So apparently, oh, wow. he's so in got, legal limbo. He's in legal, <laughs> uh, once again, <laughs> in legal limbo. Uh, which I think is, is quite, uh, quite amusing. <clears throat> Oh, that's fascinating. Yeah. Yeah, I didn't know that. That's pretty cool. Very cool. I was wondering what, but you know, there's still a chance the the wrath of Moriarty could be a, a real thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a script here. Hey, so, um, okay. So, we, uh, so uh, what do you guys think of uh, the performance of the actor who plays uh, Barclay? Uh, um, uh, specifically Dwayne. in that. Um, like the second scene where he like, he's like, oh, how do you know the captain? He's like, oh, I know the captain because like, you know, this thing. And uh -huh. he gives him the rundown. Like, what did you guys think of that scene? That 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 scene, I guess it was, it was interesting because you, um, I guess for the, you know, each episode is supposed to stand its, on its own, right? Mm -hmm. But there's obviously a lot of, of, of uh, backstory when you bring back Moriarty. So, Barkley, having not been in the previous episode, could ask the questions that the audience might have. Yeah, you know, and yeah, and I like that. That's true. That was sort of that was interesting because, yeah, why is Barkley in the episode? Or well, Barkley's in the episode because he didn't know what happened in the last episode. So <laughs> he's kind of the audience seeing Moriarty for the first time, which I thought was an interesting use. And then mm -hmm. he gets the best line. In the whole episode, at the end, because his oh. neurosis kicks in, and right. he's like, 
computer and program. Yeah, actually, that's really funny. Yeah, he just wants to check because he's so neurotic, which I thought was the best part of the episode. It's a it's a Mobius type of idea, and it's pretty trippy. And I think that like, you know, it's certainly something that, you know, I I really hope in my lifetime we get to like uh, experience something that's like the holodeck. Did I tell you guys about this? Um, I I know I told the doctor, but Braxton, there's this um, this uh, virtual reality experience uh, for Star Wars, and they have it at the Disney. I think they have it at the Disney uh, Village now. Is where it is. Mm -hmm. There's one in Las Vegas. That's where I went to go see it. But it's different from a normal virtual re virtual reality experience because normally you just put on the goggles and you're kind of like looking around and you only move within a room. This is a whole compound, and they created like a bunch of rooms that you can walk through, right? And they're all mm -hmm. mapped to something digital, right? So, uh, you know, I must, uh, you play a stormtrooper in the game. And so I put on this thing and it was the most realistic experience. It was the closest I'd ever been to actually being in the, on a holodeck. When I got on this like lift that takes you above the lava on Mustafar, you feel the heat and the wind blowing through like, your face and like it's just nuts i was gonna say hair but i don't really have hair but <laughs> oh no i think we lost braxton oh there oh, he is <laughs> but anyways you feel the heat you feel the wind uh you know it's just it's just totally crazy when a when a uh, blaster hits you, you feel like it actually jolts you where where it seems to have hit hit you it was just like one of the best experiences and i completely forgot that i was wearing this gear and I was totally immersed in the experience. And so I thought, wow, if it's that easy, can, I, I mean, I can just imagine what's ahead in the future. Like, <laughs> it's going to be pretty insane. Hell yeah. Hell yeah. We could literally explore Mars, the moon. I mean, we've already mapped the surfaces of those, you know, of those planets. Like, without being there, we can, mm -hmm. like, have an approximate experience on, on both of those places from Earth. Pretty neat. Interesting uh, implications for space travel. Very cool. Now I have a question. What do you guys think about the uh, the Contessa as a character? Do you think if if do you, number one, do you think she's necessary? And number two, what if what if she's just pulled out of the plot? What what what, what would it have affected it much? You know, I thought it was uh, so like. Uh, now European for Captain Picard to say, oh, you know, I can tell that you're a woman of good breeding and 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 uh, like and culture, you know. And she was like, oh yes, like I'm a countess, like yes, of course I have like good breeding <laughs> and like I'm a woman of culture, you know. Um, I don't know, like I don't have um, uh, that much appreciation for. You know that part of um, of uh, of world uh, of world history. You know, like the land of like kings and queens and things of that nature. You know, um, I don't have much interest in that. Um, I don't know. I felt like the countess wasn't very interesting to me at all. Did you buy the love story? Of no, it not. was. I I also okay. thought. I also thought like yeah. I also thought it it would have been. I don't know why they added her, except that the actress was pretty good. I liked her. I, I thought her performance was pretty good. She reminded me a little bit of what is it, Jane Seymour? Mm. Uh, but uh, is that, ironically, uh, is Jane the, Seymour from Weird Science? No, no, Jane Seymour that's... from from uh, Doctor Quinn, Doctor Quinn, Medicine Woman. So I thought of it kind of as uh, as Moriarty creating his uh, his perfect woman, you know. Like but he, he was, said the computer created, created her, it for him. Yeah, I th th something that was missing from the episode. From something from that, yeah, that's missing. I think it's like I think Picard when he put Moriarty into. I don't know. I think the computer just create. I don't know. Maybe it created her as a character that was supposed to come up in the last mystery, you know, cause ultimately these are characters that the computer's creating to give you this like Sherlock Holmes mystery. Mm -hmm. uh, this countess doesn't actually, uh, doesn't actually exist in Sherlock Holmes. Right. She's a fictitious character. She, she's made mm -hmm. up. Um, but I like the actress and she was in um, Sequest for like 20 episodes. Oh, very uh, cool. <laughs> I remembered very her from Sequest. Yeah. Too. yeah. I just think that like, 
Moriarty, uh, the actor who plays Moriarty, I think is British. I don't know if she, uh, if this actress is, she might be, mm-hmm. but I thought that yeah. um, Moriarty did a great job of being a, be- a believable Victorian person. Yeah. Whereas she was just the cliche Victorian person. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, like there wasn't but- much depth to her character. And even in that mm-hmm. one scene, like she's appealing to Moriarty uh, to listen to Picard and give him back the the uh command codes you know mm-hmm. saying that that's the only way you know like and he's like yeah. Uh, yeah he doesn't say it but he's all like oh you know there are things you don't understand my dear just you know go go be a countess mm-hmm. like you know mm-hmm. like- <laughs> <laughs> i mean you know i feel like um what more could a common man from you know the middle 1800s want than a countess with lots of money <laughs> she's got good breeding she just wants to like hang out and have fun with you. Like she's got all the money. Like you've got all the <laughs> know-how, dude. Like I feel like that was his perfect woman. I feel like that was like his dream woman. Like oh, like I yeah, feel like amazing. you've just convinced me that I need to go back to being straight to just be straight and find a sugar mama like the countess. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> you just stole. I was like, oh yeah, that does sound like the life, doesn't it? <laughs> here's the thing. Here, here's my problem with her. And I do like the actress. The actress was for Stephanie Beecham. She's she's done she used to be on some some of the Thanks, later her Hammer, name. Hammer horror movies. Uh and of course, she was on Sequest. I appreciated her a lot on Sequest. Um, but I, I see. I mean, again, this is me, the Sherlock Holmes fan. Now, I have to admit, I, I actually don't like. I, I don't think he's a great Moriarty, really. Oh, really? Wow. Moriarty is supposed to be a shadowy, uh, behind the scenes king of a, a criminal genius. Okay, I mean that's what you get from the books, and that's what you get from most of the good Sherlock Holmes adaptation is that he's he's a he's a criminal mastermind, and uh, and actually in the first um, in the previous uh, Sherlock Holmes episode, the Next Generation, uh, you know he was hanging out around with with hookers. So I mean he's not hanging around with with high society. He's hanging around with with people more in I guess more in his station down there in in the in you know where the criminal element is uh i i i think but i think this is an example of because the character does become enlightened as he says and even though he still resorts to these sort of like God. criminal ideas i think that i think in doing i think he's a moriarty you know again he's something new which is what he keeps claiming he's not moriarty that like he loses the the essence of being moriarty by becoming the refined gentleman who's in love with the countess or the, the countess or whatever. Um, I, I, I just didn't buy it. You know, mm-hmm. I, I, I actually, I, the first time I saw it way back when I was thinking that Moriarty was going to some, you know, once he, he got what he needed, uh, he was going to, to kill the countess and show himself to be Moriarty and be like, Oh, I don't, I don't, I don't care about you. You were just a prop and, you know, shooter or something that would have been Moriarty. And then that's true. You would have had (laughs) art or data be, be Holmes to his, to his, to the Moriarty and have to defeat him. But, but I just never felt much of a threat from Moriarty. I mean, yes, he did. I don't think we're, a clever I don't think we're meant to. I really don't think we're especially in this episode, I don't think we're meant to. The the, the uh he's the arch nemesis of Sherlock Holmes. Sherlock Holmes says but he's not me of but that's not he's now the arch nemesis of data. That's what he really is. He's not he can't you can't you know what I mean? Like, yes, his name is Moriarty because he's, he's like, you know, that's the character that he started out with, but he is essentially uh, the computer's response to data mm-hmm. like he's a brother or a nemesis for data is essentially mm-hmm. what he is and he, i think he acts appropriately mm-hmm. i don't know i i would have preferred a more evil i know i mean I come on like who would yeah I, I hear what you're saying <laughs> well you know, the thing is you know but in a sense i feel like he certainly is uh evil uh, in this episode again he puts the ship in uh in jeopardy he puts all lives <clears throat> in uh in jeopardy 
you know, so like they're moving to the um, to the they're merger of the planets, and he's like, oh, well, unless you guys like give me my freedom and let me go, like all of you guys are gonna fucking burn. Oop, sorry, all of you guys. <laughs> that's fine. Yeah, <laughs> that's fine. We can oh. get one F. In the PG thirteen, it's fine. You can get enough. It's All late right. in the broadcast. All of you guys are gonna burn up in the merging of the planet again. But do you see? think he really? Do you think that did like you had feel they that not, threat though? Did you really feel? Like did that? you feel like he would? No. Well, I'm asking. Do you? Did you feel like if they were not successful, quote unquote, like as they weren't, but if they hadn't shown that they were successful to him, do you think he would have handed the keys back over at the last minute, or do you think he re really would have let the Enterprise burn? So again, uh, so I think that the episode was wonderfully acted. I think that actor is very, very good. Uh, I felt the urgency uh, by the cast. I feel like he would have destroyed them all to get what he wanted. Um, and I think that Moriarty would have done that. I think that, um, yeah, I think that that actor, he did a great job. And then the, uh, drawing from the source material as well, that man was very selfish and he would have destroyed everyone to get what he you really wanted. you really felt it i didn't think it. Yeah. i i thought he would have actually like i i will i like to believe that he would have actually not let the crew die but maybe i have i have more i have more sympathy for the devil than you do <laughs> <laughs> um he was a good actor. Wow, we got I, I admit he was a, he was he portrayed the the part well. I just wished Moriarty had been truer to to the original conception, I think, uh, mm -hmm. of the character, you know. But mm -hmm. but I agree. The actor is mm -hmm. very good. And uh and and yes, it, when you when you look at it, he he wa he was if, if he didn't get his way, he was gonna let the ship uh you know get destroyed and killing you know, thousands of lives so yes theoretically yes it, it 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 was a horrendous thing that he was uh he was gonna do i i personally didn't feel the i i, I just i just felt that the episode kept softening him up mm. scene mm. and it's like the scene where he comes in and he kisses the countess and barkley's there oh <laughs> Oh well, and he I'll doesn't just kiss her. I actually wrote a note. He's like fully passionately making. I mean, that was like heavy making out for right. like, yeah, like, <laughs> for like the nineties. Like, they're they're like were, even Bar uh, Bar Bar no, uh, Barkley kind of like he starts off like ah, and then he's like oh, like they're really going at it. Like, right. but, I mean, I just he, like to 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 downplay the villain the villain quality of 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 what was of, of this character. Um, you know, something I something I never caught before was uh, the way that Picard kind of lets Riker in on the plan uh, of what to do is he tells the Countess um, that the way that they figured out to um, make the transport of objects from the holodeck to reality successful is by uncoupling the Heisenberg compensators. Right. And and so, like, of course, Moriarty tells Riker to do that. And that, like, kind of hints Riker and they do you know the crew does that a lot they speak in like you know a shorthand or a code sometimes and you know this is like an old Star Trek trope but we love it um, but anyways uh, the he Heisenberg compensators uh, must be a reference to the Heisenberg uncertainty principle in physics and so I like that because they are they are the uh, that's the kind of the device they use to like trick Moriarty into thinking he's beamed out of the holodeck because they uncoupled the uncertainty compensator, so there is no certainty as to where you are, <laughs> which is kind of cool. Yeah. cool. <laughs> it is clever, yeah. I agree. Uh, do you guys uh, have any more notes of, or? Topics to discuss about this episode. I, I've I've got one more bit of trivia. The uh, the ac actor who played Moriarty uh, was the captain of the Enterprise, the aircraft carrier, the Enterprise, in the Hunt for Red October. Oh, oh wow. my gosh! You're absolutely oh, right. Wow. I didn't I didn't do a deep dive onto his IMDb. I I saw that he was in Elementary, the new show Elementary. Uh, he's been on Gotham, Frasier, Dynasty. So was uh, 
So was uh, the actress who played the Contessa. She was also on Dynasty. I guess they must have known each other from that. And then, of course, I remember him from The Nanny. <laughs> uh, right. He played the butler in The Nanny. Yeah. The butler in The Nanny. Um, yeah. Oh, wow. That's pretty cool. That is very cool. A little personal trivia. Uh, the poison that uh, in the opening, going back to that opening scene, the poison that's on the cigar is called strychnine. Yeah. And my father was accidentally poisoned when he was a child with strychnine. Yes. And wow. uh, yeah. And an American doctor uh, saved his life in Pakistan. Uh, uh, Dr. Rice, who was able to, to, to uh, um, get the poison out of his system. Oh my gosh! Wow. My dad claims that that's the reason why, to this day, mosquitoes will not bite him. <laughs> hmm. That's that's super interesting. I didn't realize that strychnine was uh, actually a a real poison. Right? Yeah, rat poison. They, it's a rat poison. It's still used today. Um, you said you had an announcement. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Doctor. <laughs> I am going to Florida Supercon uh, next week for uh, for all four days. Oh really? wow! And uh, Commander Riker is going to be there. Jonathan Frakes and George Takei and Nichelle Nichols is rumored to be there as oh my well. God. Is Spock going to be there? No, <laughs> no one else. I don't think anyone else from Star Trek is going to be there. It's more of a all. It's an all encompassing thing. What's that? Jason Isaacs will be there. Oh, Jason Isaacs will be there. That is true. Mm -hmm. That's right. So Cap Captain Lorca. I'll get to meet Captain Lorca. How exciting. So I'm doing uh think... I'm going to a shore leave uh here in uh in Baltimore, uh, uh mid July. And Ooh, uh, what is shore leave? Uh so you know, like it's like a, a little Star Trek convention. Uh and oh, cool. Ethan Peck. Uh, and the uh, and the guy who and and Captain Pike uh, Anson Mount, Anson Mount. Are, are both going to be there. Gosh, I cannot wait to. I cannot That's wait. exciting. <laughs> oh my gosh, those guys are so amazing. Yes. Wow, that is cool. And it's oh, called Shore wait. Leave. It's called Shore Leave. So uh, Shore Leave, I think is uh is uh, a smaller uh, kind of event that's in a more lot Star of Trek focused. It sounds. Sounds right. like it's 100% Star Trek focused, yeah. Mm -hmm. And I feel like they're all around the country. Oh, we need to get on the ball here, Doctor. Dude, hopefully, <laughs> there's, a, hopefully there's a shore leave near you guys. Huh. I, I hope so, too. Um, yeah, I'm looking it up one, one other note. Uh, today's the last day of the month of Pride, and this was the 50th anniversary of Stonewall. If you guys don't know what Stonewall is, please go look it up. And there's actually a really great... Uh, StoryCorps uh, has been covering uh, Stonewall this whole, like just everything regarding Stonewall and, and uh, Pride and all that stuff the whole month. Uh, so there's a lot of in, uh, interesting programs on the StoryCorps uh, podcast, including the original documentary that was made uh, after Stonewall happened, uh, which is pretty interesting to hear those interviews. Uh, and, and I just, uh, the biggest thing of note to me is just how people spoke differently. I know it has a little bit to do with the recording technology, but mm -hmm. just the tone of people's voices and the way they spoke was, I think, a little differently uh, 50 years ago than it is yeah. today. Uh, <laughs> but um, yeah, so I've never actually been to a, a Pride. I've always somehow, I, like, I've been near them, but I've, I've been working or traveling. So next year, I intend to go to as many Pride celebrations as I possibly can to make up for all the years that I haven't. And I will show my Star Trek pride and my LGBTQ uh, and all the other letters that are inherent in plus. between. <laughs> pride. LGBTQ plus. Plus. Oh, is that how we say it now? Okay, cool. Plus. I like that. Yeah. <laughs> I like it. Uh, <laughs> you know, um, looking at the guests, I'm I'm impressed. They have their N N Nichelle Nichols is also uh, announced at, at going to be there at Shore Leave. So at the Shore Leave in Baltimore. The one in, Bal in Baltimore. Uh, so really, and all John Glover. Wow. All that I'm focused on is uh, is Ethan Peck and Anthony. <laughs> 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 
<laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, Michelle. I'm, 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 I'm imagining if I were to be like, <laughs> be. okay, Braxton, I have to insist that if you do meet Michelle Nichols, you have to give her some proper uh, time because she is a queen of Star Trek. She's Star Trek royalty. I know you're not into kings and queens and stuff, but she is Star Trek royalty. And so I insist you have to try to get a Starfleet Boy interview with her and, uh, and, and get her on. She's <laughs> She's not this is also her farewell tour. Uh, she's not yeah. going to be doing uh, media and, right. um, yeah. and stuff after after the, after 2019. Yeah, and it's actually really sad. It, the, um, she has um, dementia, Alzheimer's, mm. um, and so it's you know in, in the more it's starting to get into the more advanced stages. So it's actually a blessing. I hope I get to see her at uh, Florida SuperCon next week. I'm really excited that she's going to be just there uh, and accessible mm. to fans. So. Uh, all right, cool. So it's time to rate this episode. I will begin. Oh, I give this episode. Softly, boy. Oh, no, you're too. You're being too fast. Oh, um, oh, we're not done with the discussion. <laughs> <laughs> no. So, so you guys have to tell me what you thought of the plot twist, meaning that oh, halfway through the episode, we're like, oh, actually, we're still on the holodeck, uh, Captain. <laughs> uh, none of this is real. We are just on a holodeck. How are we going to figure our way out of this? Oh, when I was a kid, my when I saw this for the first time when it aired, it was like a, definitely like a oh mind blown type thing. And and then when it twists again and they get Moriarty in the end, I'm like oh, mind blown twice. Uh, and now, like I said in in the beginning, I just can't help but make all these like uh, correlations because like this kind of mind bendy twist and turn type of uh like storytelling has become really really popular and i think that like even in a sense i would say that like i think to a degree i forget who it was that said like uh you know in french cinema they were the first to like do this thing of not the first but they kind of popularized this idea of like it doesn't have to go in order of like you know beginning middle end right like so that's kind of like the the vibe you know, that I get here is that like, you know, although it's not, you know, l that way of beginning, middle, end, it's definitely still like, oh, like the audience was definitely duped. Uh, it holds up al after all these years, because like I said, even though I knew what was going to happen, it still kind of gets me every time, just mm -hmm. a little bit, just enough to be like, oh yeah, to remind me of how I felt that first time. So I really enjoyed that. I love that kind of storytelling. And uh, I, 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 yeah, I think it works really well in this episode. I have to ask the question though. So, because data doesn't see the same way we do. <laughs> sensors, you can. Data couldn't sense that he was in the holodeck still. I again, I say to you that the computer created the nemesis for data. It's the one thing Moriarty would think of is how to fool data, but he doesn't for long. Data quickly realizes it. You know what I mean? Like it takes him a while, but like I don't think Picard. Would have come to the conclusion that they oh. did from you know what I mean from seeing that like the Picard would have been just endlessly in this like holodeck nightmare until oh, but it, like... here's the thing but the computer created the perfect illusion because the thing is not even Moriarty understood that they were still on the holodeck Moriarty thought that he was real the doctor examined him and she was like oh oh no like, that part so like, Braxton. Brexton, that oh, part man. is Moriarty tricking. Yeah. That part is all Moriarty tricking Picard, Data, and Barkley into right. thinking that he's real because in the meantime, he's trying to get Picard's codes so right. he can control the real Enterprise. And that's why right. Picard... Oh, yeah, they... <laughs> so Picard... So, so then... Right. And We're then he's like... Yeah, and then when Picard realizes it's all a thing, then that's when Moriarty's like, okay, yeah, it was fake, but unless you guys figure it out, I'm destroying your ship. And then Picard creates another holodeck program within the holodeck program <laughs> to like F with Moriarty. And that's why this episode, I, again, it's it's genius because even after all these times we've seen it and even, even after this whole discussion, you can realize how easy it is for the audience themselves to get confused. So, boom. 
Braxton's th- I've sent yeah. him into a mind, a mind. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. My mind is blown. <laughs> and to go one step further, right now, you are in the holodeck. And none of <laughs> <laughs> Uh, <laughs> right now, we are not really <laughs> we're not real. We're not real. <laughs> unless you hand over the all. command codes, unless you hand over those command codes, we're not gonna let you uh let you go. There's a um I actually wrote down Moriarty's command code because I think it would be a great um a great uh title for a Star Trek spin-off novel and uh let me see if i can find the command code it is moriarty alpha 24159 <laughs> or it would at least it would make a good password uh to something <laughs> okay that's but, i don't think a novel with that title is gonna sell man <laughs> <laughs> do you guys do you guys uh i know i know uh the doctor has no expectations for the picard show um i'm trying to keep my expectations uh also Moriarty's open not gonna be in the picard show but would you be upset if moriarty were on the picard, picard show? no there's no moriarty's not gonna be in the picard show <laughs> you want to put some money on that yeah i'll, <laughs> doctor? I'll, I'll give you all fat dollar that moriarty <laughs> All right, I agree. I think you've already won. I'll hand you that dollar. But still, <laughs> if he were on the show, I would have been. I would have been upset. I think it would be a pretty cool thing to have him come back at some time in the future. Very cool. I uh, I think the same thing, but I don't actually have any expectations for the Picard show. I don't know what it's going to be about. I saw uh, the preview where he's like in the vineyard. Uh, mm-hmm. It's like thirty years later. Um, I don't really have any expectations. I have heard that um, that uh, Brett Spahn is going to be in it. I had heard that uh, Counselor Troy is going to be in it, but I don't know. Um, I don't have any expectations. I haven't even heard those rumors, but yeah, yeah, interesting. Are you excited for it, though? Oh, of course I am. I'm excited for anything that is, uh, that is Star Trek. Uh, anything that's Star Trek, I'll definitely give it a watch. Okay. Whether I like it or not, What's- <laughs> right. But yeah. I'll definitely, but I'll definitely give it a watch. <laughs> Absolutely, right. That's the thing. That's a uh, thing that Star Trek has uh, a lot of goodwill and abundance for those premieres. <laughs> mm-hmm. I didn't make it to. I didn't make it through Enterprise the first time or Voyager the first time around. Enterprise I'm still was trash. <laughs> no. Enterprise was trash. Wow. Oh, oh my god. Like, no, the oh my that, gosh. No, <laughs> the doctor the loves the way that UPN was uh was selling sex with uh with uh to Paul and Yoshi. Oh my gosh, that stuff was gross. Oh, I think, oh, I think seven of nine it. wasn't worse. Oh, you know, but but no, it was oh. it, it was it was, it was no, it wasn't same thing, skin tight, and yeah, come on. No, all right, this Why conversation is first? descending. This conversation is descending into drunk space nine territory, so uh, maybe we'll maybe we'll pick this up again on an, on another episode. But that is funny to find out that you think Enterprise is trash. I uh, wow. where, where the doctor that loves it, we'll have, to have Braxton on, a, on, on our yes, we'll have to, <laughs> when we get to Enterprise. That's gonna be good. That's gonna be good. <laughs> Yeah, guys, time to give ratings. I give this episode an eight point two. Okay, well I'll go second. Uh, I give this episode uh, an eight point seven. Uh, so I think that it was a really smart uh, episode. Obviously, the episode had me fooled. Um, so it was a really smart <laughs> episode. It was very, very well uh, acted. Um, I love the data episodes. Uh, I also love uh, Jordy. Um, uh, you know, our um, this is not a protagonist. Was a protagonist and then a um, antagonist. Our antagonist. The antagonist. Very, very good. Well acted. Smart story. Uh, part two of it ended great they were like oh okay we're gonna like you know get the upper hand um on the antagonist and we're gonna send him away it's like okay well you know 
He's got a lifetime of experiences programmed in this uh, in this holodeck, and he's just gonna like be like uh, four years. We can just like leave him on the shelf, and like it doesn't even matter. <laughs> <laughs> it's so true. Before I get into it, I want to ask the two of you because this this is one of the few direct sequels, you know, on on the show, you know, where you have one episode and they they do a direct sequel later on. Which of the two do you? L- do you like better the first Moriarty episode or this Moriarty episode? Ooh, that's a really good question. Um, for me, I would have, Oh, it's so it's really tough when I try to choose, but I guess ultimately I like this episode because what we didn't even talk about in our discussion was that like, there was also all this cool science stuff, uh, you know, with the, with the way that the holodeck works. It's it just from a, f- this is the kind of stuff I ate up as a kid. It and it was one of the few times where the techno babble seemed to make sense. Like there wasn't really a lot of stuff that you couldn't understand. You know, even though they were talking about Heisenberg print, you know, Heisenberg compensators and like mm-hmm. you know memory diodes, it all kind of just still made sense. It's a you know, I just yeah, I think this one is just slightly better than the first one. The sequel is a slight improvement for me. <laughs> I don't remember the first one right off. Okay. Uh, but it's you... with Dr. Pulaski. It's with Dr. Pulaski, and she agrees to go. She's still like, you know, she's kind of still like, uh, it was early in the season, I think, and she was, or mid season, and she was like still uh, betting that Data couldn't beat, you know, a miss, you know, she couldn't, that he couldn't like really improvise, that she thinks of him as like a real machine. Mm-hmm. And so that's when Jordy takes her in there and Data solves everything like too easily. Like he's just able to like quickly put together everything. And she's like, well, this isn't a real mystery. And so that's when jo- Jordy's like, oh yeah, a computer created an adversary worthy of defeating Data. And then the computer creates this like crazy scenario. So who is the and, hostage uh, in that first episode? Pulaski. It's Dr. Pulaski. Oh, okay. You know what? Yeah. Screw Dr. Pulaski. <laughs> you know, I prefer the second episode. I prefer I prefer the resolution. Uh, what about you? I love it. I uh, I give this episode a seven. Hmm. Oh, the lowest well. of our scores. Uh, seven is still good. It's not an eight, but it's seven is still good. Um, <laughs> I think I actually think I liked the first one. I probably liked the the plot better in this one, mm-hmm. but I liked elements of the f- first one better in the sense of of you you there was more of going into the world, mm-hmm. into the Victorian world. You know, they had those they had some amazing Victorian sets mm-hmm. in the first episode, and here we only basically only had the uh, the uh, Sherlock Holmes's drawing room. Uh, I think uh, Moriarty was more of a villain in in the first one. You know, he kidnaps Pulaski, and he's got that device that he's, you know, the Enterprise actually, doesn't the Enterprise actually shake because he pulls some lever from the holodeck? Uh, I felt more of a threat for Moriarty in, in, the, in the first episode. Here, it's true. I mean, yes, he is holding them. You know, he he has stopped the ship, and if the ship doesn't get out of the way of the two planets, it's going to get destroyed. But I, I I didn't feel the 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 ticking time bomb there as much as I did in the first episode. But I do admit the twists. This was a twistier story. Oh yeah. yeah. So it it they're both very good. But uh, I think I give the the other one a seven, so I'll give this one a seven. They're. Yeah. You know, Cool. So on average, we're at about a 7.8, 7.9. I think that's pretty great for another exciting episode of Star Trek The Next Generation. Gentlemen, do you have anything uh, in your uh, respective worlds that you want the audience to know about or promote or anything else? No, uh, I love Star Trek. I'm on Twitter. Um, I think, therefore, I am. <laughs> yes, you do. Uh, <laughs> what is it? Do you remember what it is in Latin? Ergo, what is it? Something. Oh, I forgot it. I should have written it down. <laughs> I, don't, I don't remember. Cog- but... Cogito ergo sum. That's what it is. Cogito ergo sum. I absolutely. Absolutely. 
Um, that is the thing about the episode that uh, that I'll take with me and remember and remember uh, all uh, all week. You know, I think therefore I am. You know, I think that that uh, is important uh, for us uh, in Pride Month. Uh, as people who have uh, different uh, identities nice. in the uh, public nice and large, you know, um, I think. Therefore, I am. I uh, I love it. Awesome. Nice, nice, very and- nice. I think that's a great note to end it on. So we think, therefore, we are. Live long and prosper, audience, and we'll see you next time. <laughs>